Boston, Massachusetts, the city where a revolution was born, was baptized in the blood of five victims of the Boston Massacre. There was no episode like that in America up to that point. Among the dead was Crispus Attucks. The history books claim that he was the first blood spilled in the cause of America's liberty. His sacrifice actually started a glorious conflict that ended with the birth of this nation. But what if the history books are wrong? What if Attucks was not the first victim of the revolution? What if the soldiers were not murderers? I think if there's some victims here, it may very well be the British soldiers. What if the Boston Massacre was not a massacre, but an act of self-defense? Now we refire the first shots heard around the world. This is the old state house located in the heart of Boston, Massachusetts. Today, it's a national monument, but it was a crime scene some 200 years ago. This star commemorates one of the pivotal incidents in America's struggle for independence an alleged atrocity that incited the revolution. On a moonlit evening on March 5th, 1770, an event took place here. It was known as the Boston Massacre. Eight British soldiers and their captain fired on an angry crowd of colonists gathered in this square. When the smoke had cleared, five colonists were dead. A question then arose, was it murder or was it self-defense? The shootings in Boston were the culmination of a series of violent confrontations between British authorities and colonial patriots that had been building for several years. Sometime between 9 and 10 p.m. on the night of March 5, 1770, soldiers under the command of Captain Thomas Preston fired their muskets into a crowd of several hundred colonists protesting the presence of British troops in Boston. When the shooting stopped, three people were dead and eight people were wounded, two mortally. In an instant, the colonial world had changed. The Patriots now realized that the struggle for independence would require bloodshed. When those men died, we knew from that point on that this would be a fight. The only way we were going to rid ourselves of the crown was to fight and die. Sam Adams said it was the most important single action of and including the Revolutionary War. It is impossible to overestimate the impact this incident had on the colonies and their struggle for independence. The Boston Massacre is really a milestone in the American Revolution. It changed things because people could see that they were, they were on a collision course with the mother country, and uh, th this was really the, the flashpoint. If the soldiers hadn't fired at all, there probably <laughs> would not have been a revolution. The Boston Massacre was a turning point in American history, but mystery shrouding that March night remained. We don't know an awful lot about the Boston Massacre. Um, there were hundreds of people in State Street, or King Street as it was then, all watching what was happening. And no two people described the events the same way. What little we do know about the shootings comes from eyewitness accounts, autopsy reports, and contemporary newspaper stories. But many questions remain unanswered. Did Captain Preston order his men to shoot unarmed civilians? If not, why did the Redcoats fire on the crowd? How close were the Colonials to the soldiers? Were the British ever in mortal danger? Was Crispus Attucks really the first American to die in this struggle? And most importantly, was the Boston Massacre really a massacre? or an act of self-defense. In an attempt to answer these questions, an investigative team turned the Boston State House back into a crime scene. Law professor Joe McEttrick. 
ballistics expert Gary James. Forensic pathologist Dr. David Posey. Acoustical engineer Jack Freitag. And historical researcher Murray Doherty. Our experts will reconstruct the events of March 5, 1770 to determine the events that ignited the American Revolution. They will examine autopsy reports of the victims, eyewitness testimony, and subject a rare diagram of the scene to modern forensic analysis. What we hope to learn from the study is the truth of what happened at the Boston Massacre. Specifically, we're going to look at the murder site because I think that the accepted history is not the real history here. The Boston Massacre did not occur in a vacuum. Relations between the English Crown and the colonies had been tense for several years prior to the shootings. The most powerful nation on the globe, Great Britain, exploited the natural resources of the colonies to fuel its empire. The colonists across the Atlantic began to resist. Boston was a prime breeding ground for anti-British sentiment. Geographically, Boston is a small town. Every major event related to the Boston Massacre took place within a half mile of the old State House. But the city was politically divided between loyalist and patriot. And in fact, they lived right on top of each other. Paul Revere, the patriot, lived here. And just a few doors down was the residence of the Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson, an avowed loyalist. In the summer of 1768, the British Crown dispatched four regiments of soldiers to occupy Boston, keep the peace, and collect taxes. The radical patriots, who did not want to send money to England, escalated the violence. Both sides knew that a confrontation was inevitable. Everything most Americans know about the Boston Massacre comes from this engraving. The Patriot Paul Revere created it five years before his legendary midnight ride. The widely circulated picture shows a small group of unarmed civilians being cut down by a volley of musket fire. The picture has been reprinted in countless history books and pamphlets and has been the defining image of the incident for more than two centuries but almost everything about it is wrong. The shootings took place at night, not during the day. A thick layer of snow and ice lay on the ground, and the colonists were not the passive victims depicted in the engraving. There were a total of nine British soldiers that night, not eight. And most importantly, the picture has Captain Preston standing behind his men. Revere has shown his anti-British bias. The witnesses, first of all, placed Preston in front of the soldiers to begin with. The soldiers are lined up very neatly as if they're firing in formation and as if they're being given a signal to fire by the commanding officer. This contradicts the witness testimony. This makes it look like a massacre. We have very little information about the victims of this so-called massacre, but one person depicted in the engraving has achieved a measure of fame, Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks is probably the most well-remembered name from the Boston Massacre. He was popularly touted as the first black American to die for the cause of freedom. Attucks is remembered in history as the first victim to fall to the British guns shot at point-blank range as he stood in front of the crowd. But is this really what happened? We actually know very little about Crispus Attucks. Was he a hero or a propaganda invention? <laughs> 
The investigation into the Boston Massacre begins here on Boston Common. To separate truth from propaganda, we asked actors to reenact the events based on eyewitness statements. We need this much space to make this line. Reenactments of eyewitness accounts may show us if the events were physically possible. When you come in as a mob, you're going to actually be close. We hope to discover where different sets of testimony agree and where they diverge. These bayonets are going to be down live steel. You cannot let your attention drift from the bayonets. The forensic team can focus on the places where the witness statements differ. The shooting involved eight British enlisted men and one officer. The actors portraying the soldiers have reproduced as accurately as possible the uniforms and weapons of the period, including this brown best musket. As night falls, the actors gather in front of the old state house. The busy city street has been blocked for the reenactment of the Boston Massacre, where it occurred long ago. To the right above. Yes. The weather on the night of the reenactment is moderate, but on March 5, 1770, the temperature was unusually cold, well below freezing, with a blanket of icy snow covering the ground. That evening, a British sentry, Private Hugh White, was guarding the customs house located here. Around 8 p.m., a young apprentice, Edward Garrick, began to taunt White. The taunting continued until White struck Garrick with the butt of his musket. Garrick fell to the ground. Word of the incident swept through the town. A swarm of angry citizens descended on the square. Many of them had been drinking in the local taverns. The crowd surrounded the sentry and threatened him with bodily harm. Call out the main guard! While the entire town appeared to be erupting, Captain Thomas Preston was in the main barracks across the street from the old state house, close enough to hear sentry White call for help. Captain Preston marched in with six privates and a corporal. The British rescue team reached White and attempted to escort him back to the barracks, but they were stopped by a mob of up to 300 angry citizens. No, 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 no. Hemmed in by the crowd, Preston ordered his troops into a semicircle formation and took a position in front of his men. Several people in the crowd dared the soldiers to shoot, yelling fire over and over. It made the, the British soldiers feel like they didn't have any courage. You know, they're wanting to fire, they're wanting to answer that call, but they can't. And the crowd knows they can't, so they're daring them. The demonstration turned lethal when Patriot Richard Palms struck a soldier, Private Hugh Montgomery, with a stick. Montgomery fell to the ground, then rose up and fired. The Boston Massacre began moments later. The other soldiers let loose a fusillade of musket fire. Eleven colonials fell. Once they had fired, the mob retreated. So the soldiers reloaded their weapons, and as the mob had come back in to retrieve their wounded, the soldiers thought that the mob was advancing on them to do them harm. They leveled their muskets at the crowd as if to fire again. When Preston saw this, he immediately knocked up their muzzles, yelling, don't fire, stop, don't fire. Preston ordered the men into a column of twos and then marched them back to the main guard. Paul Revere, Samuel Adams, and other Patriot leaders quickly claimed that the violent confrontation had been a massacre, a symbol of British tyranny, and they demanded justice. Captain Preston claimed that the shootings had been a tragic accident, but to no avail. 
On March 13th, Preston and six of the eight enlisted men were indicted for murder. The lawyer defending the British soldiers was John Adams, the same man who would become America's second president. The trial hinged on this question. Had the British soldiers acted in self-defense or did they commit murder? Most eyewitnesses agreed on the events leading to Richard Palm striking Private Montgomery and Montgomery firing his musket. Then the discrepancies appeared. When Montgomery goes down, there are other soldiers that are witnessing this also. They have to protect themselves, so what do they do? They, they fire back. They, they shoot into the crowd. Um, their intentions are to kill anybody. Their intentions are to get the crowd away from them. After Private Montgomery fired, some, but not all, of the remaining soldiers fired their muskets into the crowd. Some witnesses said that the time between the first shot and the barrage of gunfire was 15 seconds. Others said two minutes. The process of turning the massacre into myth buried most of the facts of the shootings. Before the shooting started, British Captain Thomas Preston stood in front of his men facing the crowd. Some witnesses said Preston ordered his soldiers to fire after the first shot. Others said the soldiers discharged their weapons on their own. If Preston had given the command to fire, he could be held responsible for murder. Did he order his men to shoot unarmed citizens? If he had his back to the soldiers, would his men have heard a command to fire? Acoustical engineer Jack Freitag turned the question around. Rather than ask if Preston ordered his men to shoot, his team will determine if the soldiers would have been able to hear the command. We're going to be doing an acoustic simulation of the Boston Massacre. We're going to see if the command had been given by Captain Preston facing the crowd, that is, with his back to the soldiers, and whether or not that could have been heard again in the presence of all the crowd noise. His team recorded sound in a variety of locations. They also examined maps of old Boston to determine the exact dimensions of the riot area. According to eyewitness testimony, Captain Preston was standing in front of his men when the shooting started. Field recordings mixed together and played back in this acoustically perfect simulation room demonstrate what the soldiers would have heard that night if he had given an order to fire. We have 32 speakers in all the walls and the ceiling and all. On each one of those speakers, we can put a different soundtrack. We can delay tracks between speakers to make sound sources moving. We can add reverberation, that is delay. We can make the room sound like a very quiet, dead music room with no reflections, or we can make it sound like a cave or a very large cathedral. OK, so the way we set the room up is the soldiers are going to be over there and then the crowd's on this wall. OK, so all of these speakers are the crowd. Very good. And actually, it's the surrounding, so we have speakers all the way around, but we don't really have anything coming out from behind us. Right. Here we go. Because eyewitnesses agreed that Preston was facing away from his men, Freitag will stand with his back to the rest of the team. He will give the command to fire as loudly as possible. That's about right. Looks good. That's about exactly what he will see if Preston's men could have heard an order to fire, or if they might have mistaken the crowd's taunts for the command. Okay. OK, so do we want to do the test with Preston? With Captain Preston, OK, yeah, so the second question. What you're about to hear is a realistic simulation of what the soldiers would have heard that night. So I'll be Captain Preston up there, giving the command to fire. And uh, you'll be the soldiers. We'll stand okay. back here and listen. OK, let's okay. see what happens, Oi. Let me There turn. we go. 
can't hear anything. Oh, yeah. yeah, all I hear it's, is the audio recording. If you're trying as hard as you can, you can kind of hear you fire, but for the most part, it was just really muffled. It's definitely more likely that yeah, they heard the it crowd, from the crowd. Right. Well, now, none of the accounts say that Captain Preston turned around, so he was facing the crowd the entire time. So I think we're, we're pretty definitive here in saying that we, uh, we think it would have been heard from the crowd, and we don't think it would have been heard from Preston. From Preston. Based on this acoustic test, it appears nearly impossible that the soldiers would have heard an order to fire. So Captain Preston may not have been responsible for the shootings. So why did his men fire their weapons? According to witnesses, the crowd had taunted the soldiers by daring them to shoot. Did the crowd bring the fire onto themselves? The acoustic experiment supports that theory but there remain other questions about the event. The British soldiers contended that they had fired in self-defense. Were they ever really in danger? What's frequently lost in the Boston Massacre is the fact that the soldiers were in a semicircle with their backs up against the wall of the Custom House, that they were surrounded on all sides, and that the crowd was close in and, and had weapons, had these uh, cordwood sticks. Just how close was the crowd to the soldiers? Can we find out exactly where the victims were at the time of the shootings? Today, in front of Boston's old state house, a star is built into a median. Most people believe this is where the victims fell. They may be wrong thanks to a discovery made in the rare book collection of the Boston Public Library. It's a diagram of the scene of the shooting, drawn by Paul Revere, the master propagandist. Oh, wow, look at this. A few days after the shooting, Revere made this scale drawing indicating the soldier's location and where four of the five victims fell. He did not include Patrick Carr, because at the time, Carr had not yet died. Even though his well-known engraving of the massacre is full of inaccuracies, this sketch is considered the most exact rendition of the scene. Now the investigative team will subject the diagram to forensic analysis to determine the exact location of the victims. We can take the actual dimensions today, and from that we can figure out the, the scale and the relative distances of this chart. Because the size of the State House hasn't changed, it's a reference point between the drawing and present-day Boston. By measuring the length and width of the State House, it's possible to calculate the distance from the State House to the bodies. I have 37 feet even. The tools required for this experiment are a laser rangefinder and a simple straight edge protractor. Joe, I read it at 112 feet and one inch. So it, so it looks like almost some of our bodies out here are about 100, 120 feet. Roughly 120 feet. Right, and you could even take it off this. In Paul right Revere's here, sketch, right? Samuel Maverick and James Caldwell were more than 180 feet from the soldiers. That places them at the back of the crowd on the opposite side of the street. The next task is to triangulate the location of Gray and Attucks. The sketch places them in front of the soldiers. So that's that's a, the approximate position for Gray, right. since he was further from the soldiers, and Attucks was very close in. So Attucks would be pretty much, according to the diagram, would be very close to Gray. Right here. Right there. The Revere diagram and the triangulation of the body's locations indicate that the star commemorating the massacre is placed incorrectly. Some witnesses claim that the British soldiers loaded their weapons with two balls, one atop the other in the barrel, to inflict more damage on their targets. Is it possible that some victims were shot by two musket balls at the same time, fired by the same soldier? Firearms expert Gary James and forensic pathologist Dr. Dave Posey 
fired musket shots into targets to try to replicate the victim's wounds. The ballistics expert used a special reproduction of a British musket from the period. It's an exact copy. It's as close as you will ever get to an original early pattern first model brown vest. It's an absolutely gorgeous job. According to the autopsy report, Crispus Attic sustained two wounds in the chest that were at least eight inches apart. The first ball has a wound path which would be described as a front to back and downward path. And then the second ball comes in and also has a right to left and front to back and also slightly downward trajectory and uh, appears to pass directly through his body. The first test attempts to estimate Crispus Attic's position in the crowd from the Revere diagram and determine exactly how he was killed. Gary James will fire double rounds into targets to try to replicate the eight inch spread of Attic's wounds. You know, it's gonna be acting like a shotgun, so the, the farther away it goes, the farther away the target, the wider the, the, the spread of the ball is gonna be, I'm pretty sure. How to make sure how the rounds are hitting the target. An ultra high speed camera will let Dr. Posey study the gunshots in extraordinary detail by literally slowing down the bullets in midair. We're actually shooting these at 1,000 frames a second, so we get 1,000 individual shots over one second. The whole premise of using high-speed video is to capture something you can't see in real time. It happens so fast that if you would blink your eye, you've missed the shot completely. In 1770, there was a very real danger that the barrel of a double-loaded musket would burst if not properly loaded. Today, that danger is just as great. James has never fired two rounds from the same musket at the same time. He does not know exactly how the gun will react to the double load until a shot is actually fired. We may end up only doing this once today, we'll see. It could be decidedly unpleasant. Because if you get an air chamber in there, one ball separating from another, you can blow the barrel out. Got it. Gary James fires three times. Each time, the result is the same. The holes are only a couple inches apart. There's just no spread. Yep, the two ball theory has evaporated. Yeah, I, I think unless he was way, way away. Yeah, I don't think I mean, so. We could go b way back and see what happens. I think, you know, we can eventually probably duplicate it, but I think it'd be so far back, it wouldn't, uh, you know, fit the circumstances. Attics was shot at close range. The ballistics tests indicates that at that distance, the bullets from one double-loaded musket would not have spread far enough apart to match the wounds described in the autopsy. I think, I think two weapons were used on this guy. He may have been the secondary target instead of the primary target. That would slow the bullet down, too. That would definitely. And then they could have been closer. Then they could have been yeah. safe. Dr. Posey and Gary James conclude that Attucks was shot by two rounds fired from separate weapons and the trajectories of the musket rounds that struck Attucks suggest that the bullet that hit him may have hit someone else first. According to the autopsy report, one round did not go straight through Attucks. It changed direction after striking his body. Could the musket ball have been slowed down or deflected after it hit him? Our investigation into the Boston Massacre has shown that much of what we were taught about this pivotal event in American history is wrong. The massacre was riot. The colonials were a rowdy mob armed with clubs and rocks. The British soldiers did not fire a volley in unison and Captain Preston could not have given the order to fire. In fact, the crowd's taunts may have brought the fire on themselves. But how did history record the verdict? Were the British soldiers justified in firing on the crowd? Captain Preston and the eight enlisted men were charged with murder. A guilty verdict would mean a death sentence. John Adams defended the British, even though he was an avowed patriot.
After enduring two of the longest trials in colonial history, Adams got full acquittals for Captain Preston and all but two of the soldiers. Privates Matthew Kilroy and Hugh Montgomery were convicted of manslaughter. Preston was acquitted because there was certainly room for a jury, a reasonable jury, to conclude that there's conflicting evidence here. With respect to the soldiers, the question there seemed to become, were these soldiers acting in self-defense? Could a reasonable person fear for his life or fear serious uh, physical injury under those circumstances? So Adams was able to convince the jury uh, that there wasn't sufficient evidence with respect to six of them and with respect to the other two that there was severe provocation and that a reasonable person would have used deadly force to protect himself. Adams won Captain Preston's acquittal, not by the weight of evidence, but by his skillful legal maneuvering. He outwitted the prosecution by selecting a jury of loyalists who would vote to acquit. The defense was careful uh, in the way that a, a modern attorney would be today in, in terms of jury selection. They had assistants who uh, looked at the background of each of the jurors, and so they, they used those challenges uh, wisely and came up with a panel that they had a great deal of confidence in. To this day, the Boston Massacre remains a controversial issue. Experts look at the same evidence and reach different conclusions. Was it a massacre or a riot? Was it murder or self-defense? This investigation suggests a far more complex series of events than anyone at the time could have considered. Episodes in history get names tagged on them and that's how the short title goes into history. Whether one calls it a massacre or not depends on one's view. Uh, I call it the Boston Massacre because that's what history calls it. The case of the Boston Massacre was, was, was neither murder or self-defense. And the reason I argue this is, is that Montgomery, when he went down, his intentions weren't to kill anybody. His intentions were to fire his musket and, and, and chase someone away. And when you look at that, uh, in that case, it wasn't murder. Is it self-defense? I want to say no, the British soldiers were still not up against a crowd who had weapons. These people had no weapons, though. The worst they had were sticks, so it wasn't self-defense. I believe the British troops were defending their lives at, at the Boston Massacre. They were, they were uh, acting in self-defense. They were threatened. They were out, hugely outnumbered by people with clubs. Uh, if you don't think that someone with a club can kill you or throwing chunks of ice can kill you, then, you know, there's... You need to readjust your view of reality. As for Crispus Attucks, former slave, revolutionary martyr, we may never know why he went to King Street or how he was shot, but we do know that he was described in almost every witness report as leading the crowd. So what is his legacy? His death let others know that they themselves could sacrifice their lives for a greater cause and that they would be willing to do that because they had already seen it done. Crispus Attucks sacrificed his life and he inspired others to do the same thing and they did it from that point on till the end of the war. Were there rights and there wrongs in that incident? Yes, there were on both sides. The taunting of the British soldiers, the provoking of them, um, Montgomery's anger and the discharge of his weapon, the loss of control. Was it necessary for those men to die in order for us to, to gain the courage to stand up for ourselves and fight? Um, I guess no one could really answer that. Um, it was something that happened the way it did, and when it happened, it caused us to be the nation that we are.